things off. Now we're going to sing, This World is Not My Home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Sing it out now. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't be at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no Heaven's not my home, then Lord, what would I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, they're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't in glory land will live eternally just up in glory land we'll live eternally the saints on every hand are shouting victory their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven short and i can't feel at home in this world amen let's sing it out now oh lord you know i have no friend like you if heaven's not my home then lord what will i do singing you can be seated it is great to see you here tonight and uh, glad to ask brother martins to come back and help with prayer requests again since he's not going to be in his vehicle he's back in the auditorium i want to give you just a couple quick things to uh, keep on your calendars and keep in your prayer they had to change the dates for camp and so uh, they canceled the first week that we were doing it and so our camp has been moved to july 20th through the 24th and really looking forward to that week. That'll be the same week that Brother Bob Gray and his son, Jordan, will be preaching. And uh, really excited about that. That's July 20th through the 24th. And the cost is still the same. And so it's from third grade all the way to 12th. We're just going to combine everyone this week. And I, I imagine everybody who's an adult understands we don't know the future. That could change. But so far, that's the plan is to have camp and to do it there July 20th through the 24th. And so keep that on your calendars, keep that in your prayers. And then 
uh, just continue to lift up one another. If you could just uh, pray as the as things go back to being normalized, things are just going to happen. They're inevitable. More people are going to contract this virus. Uh, there's going to be a deepening of divide for people on how to handle it. And so just pray for God's hand of help on our leaders and pray for God's hand of help on our church as we go into these times and then just continue to lift up one another too in prayer um, and just pray for those that have lost their jobs and, uh, and just lift up everyone that you know here. If you could just pray for each other by name, I know we would sure appreciate that. And then Brother Martins, if you can go ahead and lead us here in some prayer requests and then pray for the offering. And then uh, just remember, we won't have ushers to come forward if you'd like to give the offering. Plates will be up here, but everything that goes in on our Wednesday night offering that's not already designated goes to the other's offering. And so just remember that uh, everything that's given on Wednesday night goes to be a help to those who are in need. All right. All right. Do we have <clears throat> do we have prayer requests tonight? Yes, Martha. Amen. Good. Someone else? <clears throat> yes. Amen. Okay. Others? Yes. That was Monday. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, uh, Levi. Uh, okay. Do you have something else? Thank you, Marvin. Are there others? Yes. Yes, for sure. Others? <clears throat> yes, sir, Benny. else? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you just thankful, Lord, to be back in the church building again and thankful that we can be together and just thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, in these days as you've watched over us and allowed us to continue to have services uh, and to uh, just be able to serve you, Lord, during this time. And we just thank you for all that you've done. Pray that you'll be with our leaders and, uh, and our church as well. The leaders as they make decisions, Lord, and as we try to get back to normal, pray that you'll just uh, watch over each uh, decision that's made and, and just be with our nation, Lord, as we try to get back um, to, to normal again. Um, and pray that you'll help us, Lord, with this virus. Pray that you'll just uh, help it to uh, go away, Lord, if it be your will. Um, then uh, for our church during this time, pray that you'll continue to bless, continue to be able to, uh, to meet here and, and to worship you as you would have us to do. To do. Lord, um, for those that have lost jobs and, and others who are concerned, I just pray that you will... Uh, help those that are concerned to keep their jobs and 
for those that have lost jobs that you'll be able to they'll be able to find jobs and be able to get back to work and uh, we just thank you lord for working in that and then we thank you for martha's uh being better able to walk better and, and pray that her tooth gets better that she's having trouble with and uh just uh uh, be with uh, Miss Charity as she goes for this appointment Monday. Lord, she's been through a lot this weekend and for some time. And I just pray that you'll give wisdom to those that, that see her, the specialist, and that you'll help her to get some resolution, some answers, Lord. We know, Lord, that the healing has to come from you and, and Lord, the help. And so I just pray that you'd be merciful. I pray that your hand of healing and help and blessing would be upon her in this time, and that you would just just be just help and bless. And uh, for Levi, the needs that he has, that he needs to take care of, whatever those are, Lord, I pray that you would meet the needs and provide for that. And then for Scott Crawford, Lord, he's going through a difficult time, and I just pray that uh, you'd give him answers, give the doctors answers. Uh, pray that. Uh, They'll be able to treat what's wrong with him without further surgery. And we just pray, Lord, that you'd do a miracle in his life, that you'd help him, Lord, to, uh, that, to be free of this, uh, of this cancer. And uh, then for Alan, I've talked to him as well, and he's having trouble with his heart and uh, different things and uh, going through a rough time, Lord. And I just pray that you would give doctors wisdom just to help and your hand of healing would be upon him and uh, just help him during this time. Lord, as we take the offering tonight, we pray you'll bless it to the furtherance of the work here. Pray you'll guide and direct us, Lord. Bless the further service. Be the pastor as he brings the message. Thank you for the privilege, Lord, we have to be in your house tonight to worship you. And I ask it in Jesus' strong and precious name and for his sake. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand one more time now, and we're going to sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior. Let's sing it out now. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see.
God. His word shall not fail you, he promised. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe in that all will be well. Amen. Then go to a world that is dying. His perfect salvation to tell. Amen. Let's sing it out now. great song. I love that song. Excellent. Man, I could have sang a couple more verses of that. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 1. Tonight, Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to read verse number 6, Philippians 1 and verse number 6. Wednesday nights, we've been looking at what we know. Uh, There are so many things we want to know that we don't know, There are so many things that we are positive we do not know, but there are some things that the Bible tells us that we know. There are things that God wrote to us and allowed to be preserved thousands of years ago that he who knew everything, he who knew every calamity and every disaster that would ever befall any human being, and he knew what circumstance they would be in, he knew the things that would be true no matter what. And of course, God inspired uh, different men to write the Bible so that we would know these things. And so we're going to look at some of the promises God has made, things we know. Philippians 1 and verse number 6, we're going to find one of these things that you can be certain about. What we know, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6, I'll read it one more time. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you are saved and you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, this is a promise from God to you. And the promise is that he has begun a good work in you, and he's going to continue that until the day of Jesus Christ. And so tonight I'd like to preach a message entitled, God is still working on me, all right? And he's still working on you, all right? But you get it. God is still working on me and you. Let's pray. We'll get right into the message. Thank you again, Lord, for the day. Thank you for the chance to be here. I pray now that you would Just use the time that we have. I pray that you would help us to see the importance of this truth and to grab a hold of it. And Lord, I pray that no matter what happens in our life, no matter what tomorrow holds, that we would let you continue to have your good work in us. So use the time we have now, I pray. Make us more like Jesus Christ. We ask this according to your will, knowing that if we ask anything according to your will, You hear us, and so, Lord, we ask you to help us tonight, in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. When I bought my home, there was a a front deck that has little steps that are built onto it, and I don't know when the, the deck was added on. I'm almost certain at one point it was just a couple little steps, and somebody got the idea to do a project and built a little bit of a larger deck. It's not very terribly large. It's probably six or eight feet by eight feet or so, but it's enough that you could put a grill out there. And somebody, when they did that job, they laid the wood, they drilled it all together, they attached everything. And I know at some point they said, the job is done. And it's a great thing when your job is done and the project is over. And so when we bought the house, the deck stood and the deck still stands. But the steps got used over and over, and the wood began to get weathered. And so I realized that even though the deck was built, 
the deck was not done. It needed work still on the thing. And so we stained it. And then the hails came, the hail came, and the hail did damage to it, and people walked on it, and I realized that even though I was glad that I had stained it, I had to stain it again the next year. And so I laid some more stain down and tried different colors, and, and you know, the way I buy stain usually is I first year I bought the cheapest stain that I could find, then the next year I found some stain on clearance that was better quality, and I just said try to match it to this, and they tried but made no promises for good reason. And so I had a really weird color but nice stain, laid that stain down. And then the next year I used a different one and then the next year did nothing. And then here we are now and we were going to go walk up the steps to our house. And I noticed the steps are starting to wear a little bit, but no big deal. If a step's starting to wear, just skip it. Because you know my home philosophy. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if it is broken, you can live with it. Don't fix it. And it's not a good home philosophy. I don't want people to, to emulate it. And hopefully my sons learn better. And I'm trying. I'm trying. And so here it is. The deck was done. But then one day as we were walking some, up the steps, somebody didn't get the memo to skip the one step that was iffy. And the step just split and it broke. And so even though the deck looked like it had been done years ago, it was time for more work to be done, and we had to redo the steps. And so I measured it out uh, several months ago, and my wife had been wanting me to get on it uh, and to fix it, and so finally I did. I said all that to say, after I finished putting the steps in, along the way I needed some screws, and I didn't have the right screws, so I had long screws for part of it, and I had short screws for the other part of it. So I used the short screws, because that's what I had. And then I bought the wood from Ace, which means I didn't get straight wood, and it meant that it was bowed wood. And they said, oh, we don't know why. We can never have a straight two by four. Not a single good one. And so I used, and it turns out they don't have a straight anything. It doesn't matter if they have a straight two by four or a straight two by six. I mean, I, they don't have a straight anything. And so, so anyway, normally when you're done with a project, you can always find a use for wood. I had a little bit of leftover wood. I said, you can have it back. This is the most worthless two by four. You can have it back. All right, I had to use enough of your junk. I'm not saving this one, all right? I cut a tree down rather than uh, do this. And so anyway, I got that wood there, and one of the, the boards was pretty bowed up. And so I finally had got the things done, the steps cut, everything installed. I think John helped me do it. And it was nice. I felt like the job was done. And then the other day, I went to go step out, and the short screws and the bowed wood, it actually popped up. The sticking up, the step I went to fix, sticking up. And it was a reminder, the job's still not done. And so I had another two by four piece of support I was going to put underneath it to help the thing be stronger. So we cut it, and anyway, the job finally got finished yesterday. And I think it's done. Now I just have to stain the deck again, because now I've got new steps and the rest of it aren't, all right? I said all that to say this. You ever feel like in your life you feel like maybe you got where you wanted to get and then just come to find out you're not done yet? The truth is all of us are a continual work in progress. There is no Christian more dangerous than the Christian who has either given up or the Christian who feels like they have arrived. And they are just so spiritual that now it's their job to simply instruct everyone else. And to me, both of those two Christians, uh, while are on two separate extremes, are both guilty of the same thing. And it is forgetting this principle that God is not through with anyone yet. In Philippians 1.6, it says that we can be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let me just make several observations about this passage of Scripture tonight. The first is this. When you got saved, the work of salvation was finished by Jesus Christ. So when you got saved, you got all of salvation. But when you got saved... The work just begins in your own life. When you get saved, you are not like a painting that has been finished and signed by the author and hung up on the wall. Done. No, we're like those projects around the house that still need effort, still need work, still need maintenance, aren't probably ever quite done. When you get saved, the work just begins. Now, what work just begins? Because the Bible says we can be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. There are several things 
that we could look at for time's sake. I won't go into all of them, but I'll just say, for example, uh, the work of faith in your life is one thing that is going to continue. You have so much faith right now, but your prayer ought to be like the disciples, Lord, increase our faith, because that work is just begun. It's not done yet. I hope that next year my faith in God is greater than my faith in Him is now. I hope I learn to trust Him more now, uh, later than I do right now. And my prayer is that I can trust Him more today than I did last year. I want that work of faith to keep on growing. Of course, I want my, my work and my spiritual walk with God to keep on growing. I want to know Him more and love Him more and commune with Him more. There are many good works that are, uh, that are intended to continue on and on and on. But I'll give you just a couple here uh, for time's sake. Here's the first one, Romans 8, 29. In Romans 8, 29, what are the works, the good works that God is going to continue in us after we get saved? Romans 8, 29. The Bible gives a little snapshot of salvation. And if you understand this premise, by the way, this truth clears up any questions people have about predestination which for whatever reason seems to trip up an awful lot of Christians. Uh, predestination is a Bible doctrine, but the doctrine of predestination is not God predetermined who goes to hell and predetermined who goes to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he did for no, meaning this, God knows everything. You realize God knows who will get saved, God knows who won't get saved. Now, that doesn't mean God chooses who gets saved. It means God knows who gets saved. Just It'd be like saying God chose for Adam to sin. Well, of course not. God created Adam, but he knew Adam was going to sin. He didn't make Adam sin. Adam had a choice. God had the knowledge. He knew it. And so God knows who's going to be saved. And so it says, for whom he did foreknow, meaning those people whom God knew would accept him, he also did predestinate. Oh, there's that dirty word. What does it mean? He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Real quick explanation. It means this. Those people God knew would be saved. He predetermined this. Every saved person is going to have a work in their life that's going to make them look more and more like Jesus Christ. That's what predestination is. God determined, doesn't matter who you are, when it's all said and done, we're going to look like Jesus Christ. And that when it's all said and done, we're going to look like him. Remember the Bible says, for when we, uh, we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's when the work of predestination is consummated or completed. But until then, God keeps on working on us to make us more like Jesus Christ. And so it says that he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so here's the, the premise of it, real simple. After you get saved, God wants you to be, notice the word, conformed to the image of his son. Conformed with forming. God is working to shape us and make us into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you. Well, actually, I do know about you. You're not there yet, okay? I do know this about you. I'm not there yet. But I know this. God's going to keep working on both, both me and you to make us more like Jesus Christ. Colin doesn't look like Jesus Christ. He doesn't. By that, I mean, Colin, you still have got some sinful tendencies, right? You like to do what you want to do. You can admit it. All right, he's got honesty going for him. But God is going to keep working in your life, Colin, to make you more like Jesus Christ, to take the things in your life that don't look like Christ and to remove them so that we do look like Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, Mark Landers isn't a spitting image of Jesus Christ, but God's going to keep working in his life to remove the things that don't look like Christ so that he looks more like Jesus Christ. I don't look just like Jesus Christ. God's going to keep working in my life to form uh, us into the image of Jesus Christ. He's going to keep on doing that. And so what is that work? That work is to make us look more like Jesus. That's the first one. We get conformed to the image of his son. Here's the second one. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. 
It's right next to the book of Philippians, where we read here. So go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. Sons, could one of you grab me a water from the back or a little glass? Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. I'll start reading in verse number 8, because these are just great verses, but they're helpful to see the picture, I mean, of, how, of what I'm showing about how salvation, after you get saved, that's the miracle of the moment, but the work just begins. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's really important. The Bible says nobody can earn their way to heaven. Nobody. Right. Nobody. Nobody's going to get to heaven because they were good enough to get to heaven. If you could, you'd have something to brag about. Right. You ever hear people talk about being a self-made man they say, or a self-made woman? They'll say something like, I built this business from the ground up. Now, here's what they're doing, honestly. They're bragging, okay? They're bragging. They're boasting. I'm not saying they don't have something to brag about. I'm just saying that's what they're doing. All right? Uh, they're, they're boasting. They're saying, look what there wasn't, now there is, I did that. Could you imagine if you were good enough that God said, man, I just want you in heaven with me, that'd be something worth boasting about. Right. I mean, he, God created everything, and he said, you know what, I want to live with you because you're so good. So the Bible says that's not going to happen. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, this is important. You don't get saved by good works, right? You got to get this in your head. You can't come to church enough to go to heaven. You can't give enough money to go uh, to heaven. You can't, uh, you can't get baptized enough to go to heaven. You can't join enough churches to go to heaven. You can't walk enough older ladies across the street or help them load their groceries in their car or wear a face mask or whatever you feel like is a good work. You can't do enough of that to go to heaven, all right? But then read verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Did you know that after you get saved, God does want you to do good works, though? In fact, the Bible says that we were created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, meaning this. It means that after you get saved, not only does God want to make you into the image of his son, but he wants you to increase your good works. He wants you to increase your good works. And the Bible says here that we should continue that. He's going to keep that work in us. God has before ordained us to good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, good works. Good should just become a part of life for Christians. I don't know, just become something. You, you walk in that. You don't dabble in that. You don't visit that. You walk in them. You walk in good works. And so, after you get saved, the work begins. Well, what is the work that's going to continue until we stand before the Lord, till we die and we're in the presence of the Lord or Jesus comes back and we go by the rapture? What's the work that continues? Well, the work is to make me more like Jesus Christ. The work is to grow in good works. I'll give you a little uh, picture of this here in 1 Thessalonians. A couple more pages over for me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse number 2. Thank you for the water. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2. Paul's going to commend the church at Thessalonica because of how exemplary their faith was. And he points out three things. All right, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing three things. Your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. So he says there's three things about your faith that were a model and an example. It was your labor of love, your patience of hope, and uh, your labor of love, your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope. Did you know two of the three things that he pointed out had to do with work? They worked by faith. Remember, you're supposed to keep growing in faith. There's another thing that I could spend sermons on, and I have in others, so I won't today, but of course our love's supposed to abound and grow too, and our love should continue to grow. And so he says not only do you have example of faith and good faith 
works, but you also had a good example of love, and good love works. I'm just saying this, that as a child of God, you're going to have... You're going to have an impossible time justifying being right with God, yet never serving the Lord. You just can't. A a child of God should be living for the Lord. They ought to be loving uh, and, and laboring out of love. They ought to have faith, but a faith that works. And so the work of God is such that that he's saying this, when you get saved, there's some things in your life that begin, and I'm going to keep blowing on those coals to help them to get inflamed and to help this to grow in your life to become more and more and more and more. So I just gave a couple here tonight uh, to, just to give an example here. Uh, the Lord works to make us more like Jesus Christ. God works to do that. He works to increase our good works. Think about it like this. Uh, there are good works that we should do that, that don't just include things like giving and serving one another. Sharing the gospel with somebody is a good work. I mean, we ought to be doing those things more and more and more and more and abounding in them. Lifting up one another in prayer is an effort. It's a labor of love. And there's so many things that we can do with a labor of love and a work of faith. And God works in our life to help us to grow and increase in good works. So when you get saved, the work begins. And know this, the work is ongoing. All right. So that means right now there's an under construction notice on my life and on yours right now. I love it when a job is done. I lo- One thing I will say, even though I, I do try to make do with things that are around my house, if I start something, I just I want to finish it. I don't like leaving something half done. I don't like leaving, I, I don't like going in there and seeing a project you started to do that you abandoned. If I get into something, I want to finish it. I mean, if I find out I, I've got to fix something on my car, and I could order the part and save half the cost if I wait two days, or I could pay a little more and get the part. I just want to get the part and get done with the job. I, I want it to be done. I mean, I, I, I want, I've seen too many brake jobs where the rotors just turned to rust because they got exposed to the elements for so long. They got them turned and then found out something and left it up there. Next thing you know, there's rust. I just want to get the thing finished. I, I want to be done with it. But understand in your life, God's work is never done. It's never done. The work is ongoing. For example, uh, the Bible likens us to some things that show us here. Uh, how, about, how about in James 1.18? James 1.18. The Bible calls us in James 1.18. It says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Did you know that the Bible likens us, for example, to fruit-bearing trees? And trees never stay stationary. They're actually constantly growing. They're constantly growing. It's one of the reasons why uh, people, they get, driven, they get driven nuts by them, all right? They're pretty to look at, but I mean, they get these beautiful leaves, and then in the fall, all those leaves fall. They make a big mess for you to clean up. You clean up all the leaves, and then what happens in the spring? New stuff starts to grow. But new things don't just start growing there. New branches start forming. And the Bible likens us to a tree. You remember in John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. As the branch cannot bear fruit except it abideth uh, in the, as the branch can't bear fruit except it abideth in the vine, so ye can't bear fruit except ye abide in me. And he's saying here, that's the picture. We're like branches. Those branches get new growth. In fact, studies have been done and found that trees, as they age, actually become more fruitful. And God likens us to them. The work is never done. And a tree takes pruning. It takes maintenance. It takes effort. You can't just leave it alone because a tree is constantly changing. If you're not careful, you leave a tree alone. And next thing you know, you got, uh, uh, you got a tree growing into your house. All right? I mean, it takes effort and it takes maintenance. The Bible even likens us to a body. Of course, all throughout this, uh, all throughout Scripture, likened to the body. The human body is such that it's not ever done. 
You think about it. It seems like your body at one point starts to grow, and as you're younger, you get taller and you get stronger, and hopefully you get smarter. I stood next to my son today, and I think he's gotten a little taller. I had to check. Was he taller than me? Not yet. It'll happen. I'm okay with it. It's going to happen. And, and by the way, John wants to be my height or shorter. I said, John, trust me, you want to be taller, all right? You, you want to be taller. I am not tall. I'm 5'9". That's what I got at one point on my driver's license, and that's what I'm sticking with, all right? I'm 5'9". Don't, don't come up to me and tell me any different. I'm 5'9", all right? I'm pretty normal height. Not, I'm not terribly, I'm not tall in any way. I think the average height might be a little taller, whatever. My son's going to get taller than me. You know what's going to happen? The same thing that happened to me, I watched as I got taller than my dad. Do you know why I got taller than my dad? Because after he started growing this way, at some point he actually started growing this way. <laughs> and you shrink. At one point your body puts all of its energies into new growth. And then it starts losing it. I mean, you don't stay the same. I read somewhere that 30% of, of men by the age 30 start losing their hair. 85% by the time they're 60 start losing their hair. You, you don't stay the same. I mean, you just don't. Your hair starts to get gray if you're fortunate. Some of us got to wait longer for that. But anyway, your hair starts to get gray. Your metabolism slows down. Your strength changes. You have a hard time remembering things. You get the idea. You just don't stay the same. You don't stay the same. And God likens us to the, the body. The work is ongoing. Just remember this. God is not through with you, and he is not through with me. And so the Bible makes this promise in Philippians 1.6 that you can be confident no matter what's happening in the world around you, that God is going to keep working in you to, uh, he's going to continue the good work that began at salvation. He's going to keep on working, being confident that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it <coughs> until the day of Jesus Christ. That means, number one, you're not done yet. All right? It means you're not done yet. It's very easy to look at where you want to be and where you are, or it's at least easy for me to get discouraged. I mean, it's easy. You can start the year off with great plans. You can start the week off with great plans. And then you look back and say, what happened? You can think, I know what I'm going to do this year, and you can make a plan to do something. And perhaps you do that, and then when you get there, you realize, turns out, all getting here has showed me is that I actually need to get here and I've got more work to do yet. Or you thought for sure you'd be here and now you're not. You're not done yet. It's easy to get discouraged when we look at even ourselves and think, I wish I were here in my level of personal development or spiritual growth. But do you understand, you can only do what you can do today. That's it. You can only do what you can do today. My son has started to plant a garden. And so he's planted all kinds of things in his garden. I know he's planted lettuce, corn, squash, red peppers of some kind. What else? Bell peppers. That's it. That's it. I love all those things. I, 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 I even love squash. Turns out if it is cooked right, I like squash. And by cooked right, I mean fried, all right? And so, so I love squash, all right? Fried squash is pretty good stuff. And I used to think I hated squash, but it turned out it was just how it was cooked. So I love all those things. And all those things that he planted at one time were seeds in a little seed packet. Man, I, I can't wait for those things to grow. I can't wait for them to grow, but I have to wait for them to grow. I have to wait for him to grow. I can't, and nor can he. He can't go out to his garden and go, what's the matter with you, lettuce? You're an insult. I expected a whole head of lettuce, and what do you got, a little, little, little leaf here? Grow up. I mean, he could do it. Our neighbors might look at us the same. I don't know. They'd probably think, yeah, that makes sense. I met his dad. All right, and, and uh, you know, he could do all that, but it takes time to grow. It takes time to grow. Do you know the only thing he can do if he wants to get lettuce, 
He needs to do right by that lettuce today. That's it. And then when tomorrow comes, he's got to do right by that lettuce. And by do right, that means water it right now because we haven't had much rain. By do right, that means make sure weeds don't grow into it. By do right, that means shoot any rabbits that start getting an eye uh, to, to eat it or, or build a fence or something, you know, if you don't want to shoot rabbits. But, uh, you know, he was talking to me the other day. He said, you know, I think I'd be willing to trade a head of lettuce for a rabbit. I said, Pretty fair trade in my book, all right? Uh, but, but anyway, you got to keep the things away that are going to do it. And look, the end result, I'm pretty hopeful and optimistic of all the things that are growing. His lettuce is growing the best. Of all the things, I can't, I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever had actual local grown lettuce. I don't go around to farmer's markets. Those prices kill me, all right? I just soon go to the grocery store. And I don't go to the farmer's market and buy those things. I did. I bought some nuts. One time, I was on a Saturday. We were out soul winning, and we swung by the little farmer's market, and I bought these nuts from the, the Nutopia people. I don't know how you pronounce it right. It's in Hydro. Nutopia? It's not Newtopia? We're going to stick with Nutopia, all right? And so I bought them from those. And I thought, oh, this is so neat. I'm buying straight from the farmer. I'm supporting the farmer. We're skipping the middleman. This is great. I'm so proud of myself, and, and I got extra healthy ones, the kind coated in sugar, all right? And so, so I got those, and they were really good, and I was so proud of myself. And then I went into the co-op, the co-op here locally, the co-op where everything is overpriced, all right? And in the co-op where everything is overpriced were Natopian nuts cheaper than I bought them from the farmer at the farmer's market. I wanted to blow a gasket. I said, what in the world? I pay, I, like I bought from the farmer. I bought from the farmer. Has the farmer charging me more than the store that they sell to? Answer, I don't know, but after that I just stuck with the store. So I've never had homegrown lettuce. Now I've had some homegrown onions. I've had some homegrown potatoes. Of course I've had homegrown tomatoes. I've had some homegrown things and I love them. They're amazing. They're really good. It's, it's phenomenal, the difference. Really, it's phenomenal. I love it. They last so much longer. They taste so much better. All that stuff. Man, I can't wait for that lettuce, but I'm going to have to wait for that lettuce. I'm going to have to because certain things just take time. And you can get frustrated, and you can make a list of all the things in your life that you just know need to get fixed. You're going to have to work on them one at a time and one day at a time. And you just are. You're going to have to. Maybe you look back and maybe you say when, when everybody was telling me to stay inside and stay away from people, I did everything they said. You know, stay home and watch Netflix. So that's what they, I, they said to do that. So that's what I did. And you look back over and you say, you know, I really haven't been proud of how I've grown. Look, you can't. You can learn from it, but you can start today by doing what you know should do. Just know you're not done yet. You're not done until you breathe your last breath and you get in the presence of the Lord and then the work of salvation is completed. We get made completely into the image of Jesus Christ. Uh, until then, we've got work to do. Look, it's easy to get discouraged, but we've got to remember that God is still working in us. And I love what he says here in Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 20. It says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hebrews 13, 21 says he is working in us that which is well-pleasing. And so just know that the work of God is not over. You are not done yet. And no, God's not through with you yet. God's not through with you yet. Sometimes we feel like since we're done, we're done and God must be done. But God's not done. If you resist the Lord and you resist the things that he brings into your life to mold us into the image of Jesus Christ, which, by the way, how does he do that through? Here's a hint. Chastening, trials, suffering. All right. He brings those things in our life not to cause us pain, but to help us to grow into the image of the Lord. 
So if you resist those things and you say, I'm done, I'm done, I'm just going to stay how I am, then God's not done and he continues to send chastening your way and he will make life difficult for you. In fact, I love what Psalms 138 says. David said this in Psalm 138 and verse number 8. Psalm 138 and verse 8. Psalm 138, verse number 8, he says, The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. You notice who he said was going to do it? The Lord will. The Lord will perfect or complete that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. Just know this. Each new day is a chance for you to be more like Christ when you went to bed, when you go to bed, than when you woke up. Each new day is a chance to be more like Christ than when you woke up. Each new day, I have a chance to end the day more like Christ than when I woke up. You see, God is not through with me yet. And my challenge to us tonight is, look, don't allow circumstances to let you get stagnant. It says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It was probably easy for Paul to say that. Where was he when he wrote this? Probably in some nice hotel somewhere. Verse 7, "Even even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are partakers of my grace. What's the bonds he's talking about? Well, Paul was imprisoned when he wrote this. You know what Paul said while he was in prison? God's still working on me here. I don't know about you, but I would imagine jail's an easy place to get discouraged and think, this is a dead end. Where do you go from here? You know what he said? I'm confident God's still working on me right now. God's still working. I'm confident about it. Don't allow circumstances in your life to let you get stagnant. It may be that even though people have had more time to get into the Word of God than than they've had in recent memory, they've done less of it. Because it turns out uh, Satan is still really good at helping us get distracted. Turns out he still is. Don't allow circumstances to let you get stagnant. If you you have been lackluster in your Bible study, then work on that tonight. Get into the Bible tonight. Look, God is working to change us into the image of Jesus Christ, but as people, we know this, we don't like change. I mean, we don't. We like to stay wherever we are. I got the idea to try 1% milk. I was doing 2%. That's what I've been raised on is 2%. You drink vitamin D milk, ah, it's just really rich. Skim milk obviously just tastes like they put water in it. And, uh, and so, so 2%. This is a happy medium. And by the way, you know what milk you like? Whatever milk you like. Be serious. I know people who go, oh, I can't drink anything but vitamin D milk. Oh, I only drink, the, you know, the full fat stuff, vitamin D milk. I don't know why they call it vitamin D. It's full fat, all right? So the, yeah, there's that one, and then there's 2%, and there's 1%, and then there's skim. And I mean, you look at the skim, and I, I do think to myself, just buy the two and put water in it. But maybe I should just buy the whole and put water in it and make it into two, maybe, if I'm being fair. So I tried 1%. And you know, I tried it. Eh, it's okay, whatever. I mix it into things like oatmeal or cream of wheat. It wasn't that big of a deal. But change is just not easy. I'm used to what I'm used to. I one time sent my wife to get me some almond milk because sometimes I'll put that into things. I don't ever drink it, but I'll sometimes just put it into things. And I usually get unsweetened almond milk, which is, which is very gross, uh, but I get it vanilla flavored. Well, she went to go get me some, but she didn't get vanilla flavored. I didn't tell her, but I was like suffering for Jesus having to drink that stuff. I mean, it's already bad. Don't make it worse, okay? Don't make it worse. She's only, it, was, it was an honest mistake. She doesn't, want, she doesn't want to buy almond milk. I don't blame her for it. She's never done it again. Uh, she learned her lesson after that yelling at her I gave. And so she, I didn't yell at her. I'm just kidding. I don't even know if she, she did know it. I think I did tell her. But um, we don't like change. 
we were singing tonight. Um, the song we were singing tonight, what was the last song we were singing? What was the song before that? Beulah Land? Or? I bet I have the song list up here. It's right on the tip of your tongue. Can't forget it. This world is not my home. Okay, so we're singing this world's not my home. So we're singing this world's not my home. You know, the words are all up here. I'm singing along with you. Well, you get to that third verse. Well, if you sang that song for a long time, you know, that third verse, you probably didn't see that in your songbooks growing up. David Harris walks right, right up next to me. He goes, we're singing the wrong words. I said, yeah, I know. Nobody, nobody told this guy he wasn't supposed to add another verse to the song. All right? And, and, and here's the reason I bring that up. Because our songbook changes little words here and there in the hymns. And it drives me bonkers. Amen. I can't stand it. Amen. I can't stand it. The people that produced it are North Valley. So they, their thing on their songbook is this N and V. It looks like NIV to me. I mean, I just don't even like it, all right? I'm like, why? Why? It looks like I got an NIV songbook here. I don't like this. And I feel like I got an NIV songbook because they keep changing the words. Drives me nuts. We'll sing songs. And it's just little things. I have no idea why they changed it. In my opinion, they made it worse. In many cases, not better. So he comes up and says, we're singing the wrong words. I thought, I, I know where he's coming from. We don't like change. That is not the verse for this world is not my home. That is not it. I'm certain of it. I don't know where it came from. I don't know who put it in there. I don't know what they were thinking. But that's not right. Okay, look, that is human nature human nature. You go to somebody's house and they make a meal that you love to eat at home, but then they change this little thing about it and you go, this isn't how you make it. For example, I eat grits, but I eat them sans cheese, right? That's not how you're supposed to eat grits. You don't eat grits without cheese. You do if you don't like cheese and you're weird, all right? But uh, uh, everybody raves about Miss Martin's cheese grits. They rave about it. Oh, her cheese grits. I mean, they talk about them all the time. I hope she's making those cheese grits. We'll have a meal. I hope you're going to have those cheese grits. You know, nobody ever thinks about us poor non-cheese lovers because there's only like two of us, I guess. It's human nature that we like things how we like them. And look, if you're honest, if you're honest, you're how you are because you're pretty happy with how you are. If you're honest. You're how you are because you're pretty happy with how you are. Here's the problem. God's not content to leave you where you are. He wants to work in your life, and so we have to do what James 1, 4 says. It says to let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In other words, you have to allow the work of God to do its work. And so, yes, God's not through with me. Yes, I haven't arrived yet. I'm not done, uh, and God's not done with me yet, but I have to let God work in my life. Let me illustrate this here. Here we are living in some really different days than any of us have ever lived in before. So what's different about church right now than what on a normal Wednesday night would be? Here's one, no nursery. Now, we've had, we've had some babies make some little noises here and there. Tonight's been really good, uh, but no nursery. Well, <clears throat> till we can get a nursery, I just, uh, I, can't, I just can't do it. Or you could realize that this is God helping you to grow and grow. Amen. Adjust. Amen. Flex. Look, let patience have her work. God, who knew everything, knew that for a little while he was going to put us in a place where we didn't have a nursery. Truthfully, especially because I'm very publicly, I'm telling you, if your kid's making noise, it's okay. If they're squawking or squeaming or whatever, it's fine. This is like a golden opportunity for you to work with your kids on fitting in church. I would have loved to have had that opportunity with my kids. I would have loved to have had time just to be sitting in church where the pastor says, hey, if your kid makes noise, it's no problem. Not everybody looking at you going, why aren't you putting them in the nursery, right? It's not happening tonight. It's not happening for the last uh, Sunday or next or however long, at least for the month of May. No nursery. Or we can say, oh, I can't live without the nursery, so I'm not going to grow. Or we can grow and let's say, okay, God, I can stretch here. 
By the way, it's the same thing our church did during the drive-in service. We couldn't come into the building, but what do we do? We found another way to meet, and, and overwhelmingly, our church people were able to do it. It's just, it's a wonderful sign for me that God can take any circumstance. When he said, he said I am, you can be confident that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. That wasn't just true in good times. It's especially true in hard times. And so, did that, were there challenges? Yeah, of course there were challenges, right? The sun would get right in your eyes. You have to squint. Some of you, your visors just needed to be about three inches longer, or you need to get to park a little closer, or whatever it was. Look, there were challenges that went into it. And I know when the sun shines right in that windshield, every little bug gets distorted and magnified tenfold. I actually thought, you know what we ought to start? We ought to start a window washing ministry. Have somebody just walk around with a squeegee. We'll just squeegee this thing off, and we'll clean it off. And we were going to do it, and then we got the all clear to come back in service. And so you have to go back to washing your own windshields, all right? But I'm just saying it's just a reminder that we're not done yet, and God's not done yet. And we can be certain that, that how, this, how, how the days ahead, how they cause us to need to flex or adjust could cause us to get discouraged and just say, oh, it's different, I can't. Or we can just say, God, you've put me here in this place and you knew it and you promised me that you were going to continue the work that you began and that means you're going to continue it in the midst of this time. And it will. It will. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty thrilled. I'm pretty thrilled. I, I've got I've to actually check myself because I'm almost, almost a little proud of it to see how God's worked in our church through all of it. I mean, I love it. It's exciting. It, it, gives, it gives us a chance to have a testimony we would have really never been able to have before. I mean, it, it really does. It, it allows us to be in a place, to be stretched, to be grown, to be able to do things. And even little things like saying, or, you know, we're not going to hug each other and those things. Th- those are out of the normal. Granted, this isn't the most huggy church. All right, I've been in huggy churches. It is a little different, huggy churches. You, like, walk in and hug, hug, hug. You don't know who anybody is, and they're just all hugging you. All right, we're not the most huggy church. But still, uh, you know, that's fine. It's fine by me, by the way. I'm not trying to change that. Um, but, but so, okay, we're, we're limiting our contact and all the rest of that. It's a chance for us to grow. It's a chance for us to stay with our eyes on the big picture and to be molded more into the image of Jesus Christ. That's all it is. That's all it is. And so, look, be confident of this. In the middle of all this, God is doing something in your life to make you more like Jesus Christ. He is doing something right now in this time to help us to become more conformed to the image of his son. Look, that was true before we ever heard about the Wuhan province. That was a first for me. Or ever heard the term coronavirus, even though it was on the back of your disinfectant wipes in small letters. All right, It was on there before. That's one of the things they killed when all this happened. Liz said, I don't know what the big deal is. I get coronavirus every year. <laughs> so it was a little different strain, I think, that she got than this one. But before all that happened and before we started hearing and learning things about infection rates and epidemiologists and all that other stuff, before that all happened, God knew where we'd be. And he said, I am going to put you in this place and I'm going to continue the work that I began in you. And when he gets us through this, he's not done with us yet. He's going to continue that work until the day of Jesus Christ. So let's let God work. Let's let him work. Let's let's realize that if he sends correction into our life, we need it. If he sends difficulty into our life, we need it. If he sends chastening into our life, we need it. If he sends change into our life, we need it. Would you bow your heads for prayer?